morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Resuscitation Quality Exchange Call. My name is Deanna, and I will be your moderator today. Feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation by typing them in the chat box on the right hand of your screen or by pressing star six to come off mute on your phone. The slides and links to this presentation will be sent out within one to two weeks from today's presentation. I will now turn over the presentation to Cherie Foxbarker, our Regional VP for Quality. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we ended up having our quality state on a Friday. I know you're accustomed to having these on Wednesday, so we had a conference this Wednesday. And so thank you for bearing with us and having our quality exchange on um, Friday. If you're new to the quality exchange, we have these uh, obviously once a quarter, but we have them on five different subjects. We have them on, of course, resuscitation, which we're here to talk to today, but feel free to pass the word because we also, on the Tuesday of the week we do this, we start out in the morning with a heart failure um, quality exchange. At noon that day, and these are central time, at noon that day we have a um, stroke. Usually the Wednesday morning, and we'll return to the schedule again with those patients on Wednesday morning. At noon central, we atrial fibrillation, and on the Thursday of the week, we do coronary artery disease. So this is a great opportunity, whether you are a Get With the Guidelines user, you're thinking about being a Get With the Guidelines user, or you're doing something else with the time with the latest of the research is a great opportunity. So um, you'll hear throughout this presentation at um, sbsquality at art.org. That is our overall email. And if you want to get on the list or put somebody on the list, we'll be glad to do that. Today, what we're going to be looking at is the quality performance update at the the fallout. I just want to make sure that your entity is to a fallen off my agenda here. Um, I want to make sure that you're introduced to a bunch of CPR, community CPR options. So um, my colleague, Kevin Bain, is joining us. And then I want to give you a little bit of research that came out of the recent presentation of science from Tennessee and the Hotel in Philadelphia. So, um, first, let's kind of talk how we're doing. These are data as a six state region. You know, our overall goal, our overall goal to improve survival and discharge, and we want to do that. This happens to be an adult. Um, today, we don't have a, a bunch of users in our pediatric infant and newly born. And remember, you can always, no additional charge, to use your registry to capture any of the four um, patient groups. Adults, pediatric, that's going to be your 1 to 18, your um, infants, which is going to be if they're not from their birth through um, one, and then newly born, which means you're keeping track at the admission of their birth. So, anyway, uh, no additional charge to use those others, and you can actually get another extractor in another department and use the registry with those age groups. So, anyway, we're talking adults today. So, if we have the goal to improve survival and discharge, and actually, you recall, our goal is to double it. We want to decrease that time to defibrillation. We're moving up in this. When I look at all performers in um, the Give Us a Guidelines Resuscitation, we're kind of in that 84.3% are getting in the two minutes or less. This is really kind of a, a tricky um, measure. Um, and I've had some facilities contact me and say, you know, how can we get that done? But the strategies that I know folks have used include utilization of AEDs so that the shocks can be administered before the post team is there. Um, I'd like to pause here. Um, is anyone on the line willing to share kind of what you've done to decrease your time to defibrillation? You can type it in or if you just do star six, we'd love to hear from you. This is supposed to be an exchange. <laughs> it's supposed to be a lot of a lot of interactive, but I'd love to have it. So let's um, give someone a chance if you use the strategies to decrease your time to shock. So type them in and uh you know, let me know. Or just come off mute star six and tell us what you've been working on. And if any of my directors have insights because they have hospitals working on this, feel free to come off also directors of quality. So I'll take that feedback at any time. 
the other element, and this has really improved over the last five years, external patients that are high risk are in a monitored witness area, so uh, ICU or other kind of low ratio department. Uh, 96.6% of folks who had a cardiac arrest uh, were in a monitored um, setting. We, of course, want to, we're still looking at decreasing kind of chest compression, especially in our babies and our younger. It's not one of our achievement measures, but it's still very important. I just don't have the regional number on that. It has been quite good. Of course, for an unshockable rhythm, which is actually, that's what you would say, that time of the testing is actually, and I'll correct this when it goes in, that's 96.6, unless the switch flips up around, but it is also 96.6. So we're doing very well as it relates to that. And then that difficult one, um, requiring that you have in your documentation that there's constant confirmation of the airway. And that's been a hard one because I've noticed that many of you are missing that one when the patient's been intubated in the emergency department or in some other unit, and then they move to the ICU. It's likely the ICU has checked that but not documented it. So this number is actually coming up quite well. Um, Deanna, are there any comments or anything that anyone's got to get? No, I don't see anything. Sure. I'll take that as a note. All righty. So, um, however, and, and I'm happy, I'm your director, uh, those of you out in the hospitals, if you're wanting to speak with someone, and kind of look into your processes, have us come and review what you're doing, and make some recommendations. Even reach out to other hospitals on your behalf. We're glad to do that. So please um, let your director of quality know, and and we'll help you with these um, because there have been some strategies related to all of these measures. Now you know when we're trying to improve our survival, but there's another element, and some of you are actually doing this now. But that's making sure that we have high quality CPR. Um, so these other things are kind of measures that we're doing at the time of a code, but we also want to know what is the quality of that CPR. Um, and I'll come back to this real quick. Um, this is great. This is kind of out of order. Um, when we want to increase our CPR quality, we have to figure out how to practice a little more often. And so, we have to make sure that either you're doing checkoffs so early or you may adopt what we're calling RQI. I know this is a, probably a repeat for those of you who have been on our quality thing that I've been online and urging that you think that quality of CPR is very important. And so while you know we have the new program RQI, which allows you to put these units in your hospital, then all of your staff who has ACLS, DLS, and towels will be assigned they actually do their um, training on these mannequins. And then your card basically is extended a quarter. So you don't have to, you would never have to go to a CPR class again. And this is one strategy for increasing your competence. Another strategy is just to check people off every quarter and have them demonstrate their skills. Or, you, uh, there's some other programs through American Heart um, that you can do where you're practicing more often. So for every student, you need to practice the new interest in more often. And this is an example of why we're emphasizing this to all of you and figure out how each hospital can figure out a mechanism to um, not just do the two-year training. And here we are. Um, the red line is, of course, when you do something where you're going to have your staff practice. They're going to practice on a regular basis. And then what our research demonstrated is that while we were giving out cards and having classes every two years, you can see how the skills decayed very quickly. So that is an important element of this as well. So let's go back to our measures. I'm sorry, we're not out of order. Because we wanted to show you all of you should have received in the last two weeks a report that your director of quality ran for you with how you're doing off the 2019 data. On that report were instructions on how to run a fallout report, how to go and figure out which patients are not in your numerator and therefore need to be 
um, looked at and we need to double check that documentation. If you did not get a report, please contact um, please send us an email at this email address and we will make sure you get that and make sure that we have the right contact. Sometimes what happens is we don't have the correct hospital contact. So I want to demonstrate to you how to run a fall right report. And of course, you're going to log into your, um, what we call the PMT, so the patient management tool. And some of you have been with us a long time. This is quintile result outcome. It's down by Dr. And we're circling just a second. All right. So you are at it. Yours looks a little bit different. This is, um, and this is a demo site, so don't be alarmed. No one, the information is going to come up here. But you're going to go into your recording, and looks like I said, it looks a little different. But once you get here, we look the same. So you're going to run a configurable measure report. And um, this is a demo site. Normally, what you're going to do, because right now you're worried about your 2019 data, you're going to go here, you're going to do January, December, you're going to aggregate it, and you're going to run your report. Um, just so you know, this is, a, this is a demo site, so it doesn't have a ton of data, so I'm going to expand the here so we have more information. You're going to take the problem area, and I think the majority of you are working either on time to shock or you're working on airway documentation. So you're going to pick that measure. Then you're going to go down here, you're going to have a, a bar chart of that. So actually, you're going to change the bar chart to patient record. And, um, and then you're just going to generate. So this is going to give me all of my patients in the time to shock measure. Now I'm generating a report. Let me expand that out for you. All right. So now I have all of my patients and whether they were included in the results and whether they were in the numerator. So the first thing you want to do, I always just organize them by get them in the numerator. Because that's going to get my top group there. You have those they're included, but no, they're not in the numerator. Those are your fallouts. It's kind of nice here because when you do this, you can also go across and just get a quick glance at age, um, when, uh, what the original uh, rhythm was, whether they were shocked, so on and so forth. So I think the easiest way to deal with it, you can go directly in to the patient record here, but normally I will just export them to Excel so that I can work with them in a better way. So this is coming up. Um, all right. We will have to do enable editing, so don't try to edit when you're doing that. And if anybody just wants to run through this with your director quality, they'll be glad uh, if you're not an Excel guru. Now you can see that these are my fallouts. All of these are included, and they have yes. I'm going to look here at the time for needed for chest compression, then you're going to go over to the list. Time was when they got it, when Ross was achieved. Got all your information over here. So you can right here on this page go to your medical record and compare these and make sure these are correct. If these are not correct and you see one that shouldn't be in here or the time was different, then you can go back into the PMT and edit it and rerun this report. Now, this is a good time. Any of you with questions or you want me to show something different here? Comes to star six, and I'm glad to demonstrate whatever you'd like to see here in the recording. If you're wanting to see if you're eligible for an award, you can just pick your recognition group. We'll do adults for now, but here's the pediatrics, here's the neonate infant. What's the two adults? And this is the kind of report you would have gotten. Keep it on bar chart. Don't forget that if you want it, you can compare yourself to other hospitals of your size and it would put them side by side. I like to put everything. I can either filter this in the nice section if you just wanted those patients um, who um, live through the process. If you want to compare those who um, expired, 
for those who are alive and looking for comparison time. Um, we know that in the research it shows that. If you want to look at the day of the week and how quick your time to shop is comparing Sunday through Saturday, that's an excellent way where you just pick this and compare the selection. I think you'll find out that sometimes on the weekend it's slower. We've got some research to that example. So let me close. So, sir, I'm running my regular report kind of got off there. So here's my recognition. I've got bar chart for my hospital. Goes down, and a nice way to show this is just to put the similar messages, measures in a group, and then let's and then we'll just run it. On this one, um, we don't have the 85 percent, so I, I don't know why that's not on there. So hopefully they'll get that in the next iteration. Generate the report, and here you are. These are the four measures. Find the shock, and then it's required to have 85 percent of the year aggregated. So even if you have a bad quarter, as long as you look at for the whole year, then you'll know that you're good to go with the board. Any questions on reporting? You might be glad to show other things while I'm out here. Shorty? Yes? Kristen, can you remind us how to run the new Blue Cove report? Oh, good question. All right. So this is a nice little report. And um, what you have to do is get this cleared out because it's not in there. And now you go down to, and I might, I think it's special measures set. Yes. So here we are in the special measure set. And here's your code blue adult report. And I love this. I'm so glad they added this. And you can generate that report. And the neat thing is going to give you a whole series of reports that you might want to take to your code blue committee. Here's the first one, like where in our hospital did these codes occur? So you've got a chart, and then of course you always have um, a spreadsheet as well. And remember, anything you have here, keep it explored. So if you want to put this in Excel, you can do it. So here we've got the event location. Then we've got what kind of patients these were, whether they were already in a cardiac unit, they were in telemetry, or if they were completely in a non-cardiac unit. You know that some of our slowest responses are in non-cardiac units. Surgery, of course, what kind of surgery, of the trauma, so what kind of um, patients they were. This is nice. It's already built out here for the day of the week. If you have historically sat down or had your code blue committee on the weekend doing more things than the code blue and code blue committee, the code blue response team or your rapid response team doing other responsibilities like being the house super on the weekend and maybe during the week or not, this is a good way to validate that you need more help. Looking at when those CPAs are occurring, very important. And at the time of day, this is an important element. What about change of shift? Are we making those? Because when there's fallouts, I like to look at for that hospital and those occurred when the handoff was being made between shifts. Um, here we have the general types of units, the age, which is, of course, quite, quite interesting to see how the age is working, especially if you look at your whole year. Right here's your survival, so um, the breakdown of survival and discharge. Fired or not, what were those initial rhythms? And then looking by rhythm, here's your time to stop. We already went through that. Time to empty. Little weather was monitored with this and then the airway. So you're doing one quick report, and by doing that, it's running everything for you. You're just changing the date. So if you look at that report every every month in your code blue committee, you can just run it with one thing. Here it is, the code blue report. It's a special measure. There's one for pediatric neonates and newly born too. So that's, a, that's a, an important thing to do there. And notice that we've added here, for those of you who've been in for a while, your a um, risk adjusted survival to discharge report is here also. It's also here, but it's also in 
inside, and that is your report that gives you risk-adjusted survival. You get it once a year, and you'll get it in about April or May, and it gives you last year's risk-adjusted and what your, um, what your percentile performance is. This is something you can't get anywhere, so that's another reason it's critical that you get all of your 2019 data in um, by the end of February. Other questions and things that were typed in, Deanna? Not at this time. Okay. Let's talk back to where we were. All right. So, we will have to get your report. If you put data in a system, you need to be able to access the report. And just as a reminder, uh, probably as many of you on the phone are certified extractors. You took the test um, to be able to uh, extract the with the guidelines. Don't forget, you can set up, um, you have 10 users, you can set up other users in your organization to the observation only where they use the reporting and they don't have to take a test. So if you're an administrator or other reports, want to run reports out of there and take it off of you, you can work with your director to give them a username and password so that they can run reports. Um, they don't have to take any test for that, so that usually takes the pressure off of that. So. Let's talk about the timeline real quick. Um, all 2019 data must be extracted by the end of February. You have to have all the data in all four years. Um, if you are behind, now very few people can sample and send the patient, but if you are behind, talk with your director. How to get a strategy, um, some ideas. Um, as I said, resuscitation because the can is fairly low in terms of the number of CPAs unless you're keeping track of all of your um, rapid response or less. Um, the path is your director. Don't just give up. We may be able to figure out a way for you still to get recognized. So, you need to put all your data in by 228. During March, your director will review the data and if there's any concerns, contact you individually. Make sure we have the right person. If anybody's changed, um, send it into SMG quality or type it in the box. You know, I'll calculate it. I mean, take down and for us. We have to have contact. And then once we work together and your reports indicate you are award level, please, please, please do not change any data on 2019 discharges. After April 2nd, you can do what you want to do, but um, don't mess with it once we uh, say you're ready to go. Now, an important element, if any of you on the phone are going to be recognized and your organization has changed their name and there's lots of hospital name changing, we need to have a form with your published as name. And it really does need to be signed by your marketing leadership. So this is an important element. Right now, if you know you need that, um, either pop an email to your director or put it in the, uh, put it in the box. Or email us at www.quality at art.org because we need to follow up and make sure we get the right form for you. There is no award application necessary. Uh, many of you may have been with us for a long time where you had to go out and report and put in your percentages. That is no longer necessary. It is listed on April 1st. So pull all the data and, um, and evaluate it so you don't have to do an application. And the award list will be finalized across the late May of 2020, and you'll get a recognition kit with your um, the little icons you can use on your website, press release, certificate. You can have your director come out and present your award to your co blue committee or to a larger contingency, maybe your board, that kind of thing. So that is our timeline. Just as a reminder, all data by 228. All right. Any questions, type them in. Or start it. All right. We're here for the whole hour, so feel free to send them in there. That's not true. We won't keep them on the program. So we talked about this. Um, the CPR skill declining. I was going to give this at the end before I introduce Devin. But um, this kind of applies into it. There is the legal risk of not performing CPR is actually scientifically higher than providing the assistance. I think it was so fascinating, and I gave you the link to this article. Um, we'll see if it'll come up. But bottom line, in the research, um, they looked at 30 years, you know, kind of since we've had CPR going, 30 years, 
of um, people giving CPR. Over the 30 years, there were $120,000 of fines for, for um, performing CPR badly. I mean, for not performing CPR. But I got that wrong. It's, it's so weird to me. There's, let me tell you, doctor, $620 million for CPR that was delayed or inadequate. Only $120,000 for doing it and then, you know, it didn't work out like you want. People think that you're going to be sued for doing CPR and it's actually the opposite. And I'm sorry, I kind of bundled that up, but I've given you the link to this article. Bottom line, we need to do CPR and we need to figure out how to get more people to do CPR. Well, we have, um, and uh, now you can go ahead and switch the screen to Devin. We have many tools for organizations and companies. And so today we have Devin Bain. She's on the phone and she is going to introduce all of those tools that we have and how you might get them. Devin. Good morning, Sharice. How are you? Doing great. We're glad to see what you've got to share with. Thank you so much for having me. I think that's a great tie-in to kind of get me kicked off. There are about 150,000 out-of-hospital cardiac grants that occur each year, um, and we know that about 70% of those occur inside of the home. So um, my job is always focuses on training the community so we have more bystanders that are equipped, trained, and ready to act in an emergency. So today I just wanted to share with you a little bit of the results that we have um, and what we're doing in the community to, to provide some of that training. So I'm going to go to the next slide. I'll start with our uh, heat pass kit. We have two heat pass kits. And really the, the great thing about all of these uh, tools is they're designed to be self-split. So we have um, PPEs included in all the products and as well as online training availability. So anybody, whether you're, you have any formal training or not, can just pop in that DVD or start with training online and um, just follow the, follow the video to be able to uh, complete the training. So as you can see here, um, we have the adult and child CPR anytime and the infant CPR anytime. We're going to talk more about the adult and, and child CPR anytime first. This is the next slide. As you can see, uh, everything is included that you see in the picture there, um, the DVD, the mini hand, and then there's some additional um, items as well. But these are really designed for um, anybody who just wants to teach their, their family at home uh, how, to, how to do hands-on CPR and then how to do all the rest. Uh, the content also covers um, training as well. Um, a lot of our um, employers um, are interested in it doing training for their employees and they want to be able to give these um, so that they can, uh, the employees, employees can take them back and, and train their, uh, their families as well. So that is our adult and child CPR team. Uh, the next slide shows the instant CPR team. Uh, I want to go to that slide. Um, and again, very similar um, in all these being filled with, um, easy to use, and then, of course, this will cover the consent of CPR. So, go to that slide. This is our CPR school training kit. I actually just got to use one of these yesterday as I was at um, Charles Anderson Elementary um, in Dallas. And so, it was exciting. I had part of a class of four graders, and boy, they, they just really were engaged and had great questions. And so, um, as you know, many states, we, we, we all states, um, are required to teach annually CPR to their um, students before they graduate. But um, we have, out of our two states, we, you know, we have um, four that, that are requiring that, two that, that do not, Colorado and Wyoming do not require um, that their um, students be trained before they graduate high school. But, um, Arkansas, Oklahoma, um, New Mexico, Texas, yeah, they, they did require it. So we try to help make sure that the schools have those resources, whether that's um, through grants or foundations or individual gifts. Um, a lot of, of the tools that you see here um, are gifted 
um, train was purchasing these and that kind of thing. And then um, just to think about if you're a hospital and you like to talk about the HR, we have companies that purchase the notes for all their employees um, when they go on maternity fraternity leave. They um, send them one, so that's kind of an employee recognition, you know, uh, we want you to be safe, so that's fantastic. There's also an opportunity for new employee orientation to give your employees that. And then from a hospital perspective, if you feel like your hospital would be willing to distribute um, pink drug infant kits to all your entity babies or something like that, let us know. We are on a regular basis um, working with foundations trying to get funding. Um, we're able to make you reduce um, costs for the foundation, but you're part of it. So you can work with Devin to see if, if we could find a funder or work with a year auxiliary to fund um, a year's worth of CPR any kind of kids for all of your discharges. So um, if you think this is exciting and a great way to get bystander CPR increased or CPR with a bag, you know, you come home with a full day and you've been in the next view and you've been trained, but who else has been trained? So it's a great opportunity. I'm really a big fan of all these kids. So, um, so this is the best way to teach. And we're like, do CPR anytime and just kind of, it's, it's much better to do it with a kid with great um, and straightforward instructions. Let's see, can I share my screen again? Um, Deanna, I don't think I made it to the picture yet. All right. Well, thank you so much, Devin. I think that's important. And let's, uh, I figure every week I want to try to influence uh, my standard CPR and who can do that. I mentioned that earlier, um, kind of entry festival model, but the importance of CPR and the fact that you have much more legal risk if you're not doing any CPR than you do if you're doing CPR. So that was the point of that. In um, November, uh, it's uh, the biggest cardiovascular conference that the American Heart Association has, and it's called Scientific Session. A uh, part of that is a two-day resuscitation conference uh, that is held in parallel to Scientific Session. And so this year we were in Philadelphia, and um, I believe uh, November 11th and 12th was the day. And I just wanted to share a few of the key things that came out. This is an interesting one, and I'll show you these slides, and then you can link to the actual um, study. So this is interesting. The weekend study cardiac arrests are more deadly. So this was, and I've got the dash here. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got all these right now. I'm just going to go into it. What they went ahead and looked at was, what occurred, what the ages were, what the type of patient was, it was having an arrest on the weekend, and this is in the UK, and what they have in the UK is a, a, they looked at the number of cardiac arrests that were treated by publicly accessible ABD, and the UK does have a pretty good ABD system. We're coming along in the US and having ABD, but the UK has them pretty well out there, so they were looking at survival to hospital admission, and that's kind of an interesting um, subject. So they wanted to look at the people who went down out in public, somebody used the AED, and what their percentage of survival to hospital admission was. Um, now you know that the survival to discharge for somebody who has a cardiac arrest out in the public is around 7 to 9 percent. So this is a completely different number. This is how many live to hospital admission. And 27% uh, of the patients provide the hospital admission. But if it was on the weekend, there was a 20% less chance to survive than the patients who had cardiac arrest Monday through Friday. So that's really kind of an interesting thing. They said it was anecdotal, but that they really told us we might want to do some additional um, research in that area. So very interesting. You can read it for yourself. I'm including the links here. The next one was very interesting. This came out of Denmark, and that citizen responder CPR is a similar split for program scan crew survival and outcomes from cardiac arrest at home. You know that 70% of cardiac arrests happen at home. And the way this program works was that they have an app. And on this app, if you have been trained, he is a community ADD, so there aren't ADDs in the home. 
but if you have been trying to use this ATV, then I mean, all you will get a link, I mean, a app notice that says that there's somebody who's had cardiac arrest. So the community works together and they ask for help. So somebody in their little circle around their community comes in to the home and they either access an AED or they start CPR. So this is very interesting. So we know that most places are in, you know, we put AEDs in the, you know, the football stadium, but if 70% of cardiac arrest are in the home, how can we get in the community that this group of volunteers can help out? This is a very low study. Um, they had the system responders that were around the area of Denmark. And otherwise, they thought before EMS, 50 of the time, uh, they were there before EMS. So you can imagine, this is important for these people that they can give CPR or they can use an ATV. They're getting there a lot earlier. And the findings, and the findings, and like I said, this is also kind of just an anecdotal study, but we need to look back further on this because if four out of ten are getting there before EMS and able to deep bring this AED with them or the CPR, we're going to do a lot better on survival um, to this part. So very interesting. Um, do any of you have those AED? I know that um, there are some systems and there's some places that have those. Does anybody on the phone have a, a community thing where you get a notice and you know somebody needs CPR two blocks away? You have that type in because I'd like to see how that works. Oh, writing, and yeah, you just interrupted me to get these things on the channel. Um, this was, this was like, well, terrible. Uh, like the NIH funding for cardiac arrest research is so low compared to funding for other leading causes of death and disability. I have been frustrated for some treatment of the choir, um, those on this live or those that will send it to in recording. They were one or two who care about cardiac arrest and making sure it's improved. But I gotta tell you, I've been to so many hospitals where they don't even have a physician in charge of them. So, no wonder that when you request funding, it's gonna be low. So, you know, I'll trigger off my list, but you have access to this. So, the amount of money that NIH, NIH per person affected is $284 per person affected by diabetes, so $284. $89 per person for stroke. $53 for every person affected by heart disease. And then spend $7 for every person affected by cardiac arrest. This, I, I urge you, and I know we've got a small group this morning, but we'll put this out on recording and we'll have a larger group. We've got to figure out just how to put a focus on cardiac arrest survival. We know that our goals are to double it out of the hospital from 7 to 14 and to double it in the hospital from 19 to 36. That's crazy. 36% survival is our goal. We've got to work on this. So anyway, I thought this was quite um, shocking information. That's not very much spent on research, so if, uh, the more you can help us with our basic guidelines, it does help us to gather some information. And then the big topic, you know, related to opioid, opioids and cardiac arrest, these patients, and I don't think this is shocking, but at least it's been confirmed, these are different from other cardiac arrests. These folks are younger, they have less medical conditions, they're normally in public, the bystander rate is very high. So these folks are with other people when they have these problems. Twenty seven percent compared to sixteen percent the bystander CPR. But they're also more likely to use illicit drugs in addition to um, their opioids. So again the link is there for uh um, to read the study. So I would encourage you, this is a Oh, my battery blew. I know. Got to park down there. But um, I would encourage you to think about going to the, the Resuscitation Science Symposium. And we're very uh, blessed because the one that's coming up, and yes, it's November when this is coming up, is in Dallas. So this is a good time. We're doing it quite in advance to let you know where the, the Resuscitation Symposium is. And as I said, it's a long list scientific session. And it's going to be in Dallas, and so perhaps you could plan to go. I, this is a small conference, as you can see. Last year, it only had um, 
Again, if you want to ask a question, please just type it in on the chat box or star six to come off mute from your phone. All right. Well, I will, um, I don't, unless there are specific questions that are out there, we will um, move along. Um, I'll let you have part of your name back. But remember, as you come up with questions, if you're not working on a regular basis with your director of quality, um, for your area, for your American card, your, we can help you with a shortcut from your question and we can help you on reporting and we can make sure you get your award. Just as a reminder, I'm going to flip back to that screen real quick of the deadline. All data has to be extracted by the end of February so that we can um, get those, those awards ready on April 2nd.